Well, thank you very much for that uh, wonderful and very flattering and really quite moving uh, non-introduction. It's uh, really a tremendous pleasure to be back at IIT. So much has changed and yet so much remains the same. The enthusiasm of the students that I met with today was uh, just off-scale great. And uh, I, I really want to thank Dr. Wasan for the invitation to, uh, to come here and give this lecture in his honor. Um, actually, when I was sitting there looking at this slide as, as, as Dr. Wasan's incredible reach around the planet was described, I began to actually think, well, really, what this is is a representation of all of the people that Dr. Wasan knows. You know, it's, <laughs> it's got to be trying to tell us that story. Um, but what I really want to do today is tell you a little bit about global climate change, to tell you what's happening to our climate, what the evidence is that our climate is not the same as it was 100 years ago, what's going to happen to it uh, in the future, depending on some choices that we have to make, and talk also a little bit about the human side of the problem, especially the ways in which we Americans versus, say, other countries contribute to the problem and why this issue has been uh, so difficult, really, for people to talk about. I'm going to try to keep the science very separate from the politics. That's always my goal. And uh, you can uh, uh, feel free, though, to, to ask me any questions that, that, you, uh, that you may have in the end. So I'll try to save a little time for questions. Well, to me, the evidence that the world has warmed is ac absolutely inspiring and amazing. We actually have good enough measurements worldwide to construct maps like this one, which tell you how the planet has warmed the trend in temperatures since uh, about 1900. Globally averaged, it's about 3 quarters of a degree Celsius, or about 1.3 degrees Fahrenheit warmer than it was in 1880. But isn't it amazing how widespread our measurements of that warming trend actually are? Uh, sometimes it's asserted that the warming is uh, somehow just due to urban heat island effects. And though, of course, we have a, a good urban heat island going here in Chicago, um, I don't know of any cities the size of Chicago out here in the Atlantic Ocean or over there in the Pacific Ocean. So clearly that, that, that's not the answer. The warming is extremely widespread, and I'll talk more about the pattern in just a few minutes. If we go ahead and globally average that data, look at what the trends are as a function of time, many different groups have done this, which is why the uh, findings are, are so robust, because they've been replicated by, by different sets of people. There's a period here in the 50s and 60s when the globally average temperature didn't warm. Uh, and, and that's actually an interesting period. Uh, if, if many of you may have lived, uh, say, in the Chicago area, as I did at that time when I was uh, young, you may remember how hazy it was. We had tremendous problems of pollution back then, so we were putting a lot of uh, aerosol particles into the atmosphere, and they were reflecting energy back out to space and certainly uh, contributing to this cooling factor. There also clearly is some variability from decade to decade, but uh, what's very, very different is this last uh, 40 years or so when the warming has just been uh, really remarkable. And in fact, one of the things you can do is take a look at how warm globally the uh, various recent years have been. And it's absolutely fascinating to look at a list like this and ask yourself, how far down do you have to go to find a year in the top 25 when you weren't alive? And I have to go a pretty good ways uh, down, down to about, uh, where is it? I can't quite see from this angle, but 1938 is in there somewhere. Um, it's, it's really quite, quite remarkable. And if you're a young person today, you're certainly look at a list of the top years like this, and you know you are living in the warmest period in the instrumental record. I see a few people standing up in the back, and I just want to invite you to please come down. We've got some seats in the front here, front row, perfect seats, good visibility. So anyone who wants to move on down, uh, this is now your big chance. Excellent, thank you. Please do it, because uh, I want you to be able to see what I'm talking about. OK, if we uh, uh, have questions about thermometers, and that's a fair question, we ought to also look for other evidence that will uh, be independent. And one of the most interesting things, I think, to look at are the distributions of glaciers worldwide. Uh, there's uh, been many different studies of these. There's a lot of glaciers around the world that can be studied. There's a wonderful recent uh, paper in Science a few years ago that looked at 169 glaciers from essentially every continent in the world. 
No one glacier can make the case, and there are exceptions. There are some places in, in, in Norway where there's been an increase in snowfall that's outpaced the melting, but that's by far the exception. The overwhelming majority of glaciers worldwide are retreating. So here's an example of one that in 1912 was uh, extended down to here, but as of 2001 was almost gone, and that's really quite typical. So there have been big changes in glacier lengths uh, all around the world, and if we have a look at them averaged around uh, different continents and take a look at how much warming would be required to explain that glacier retreat, what we find is something very consistent with the thermometers. And the other thing that's nice is that the records of these glaciers are good enough to go back, say, all the way to 1600 and show that it was, uh, they, were quite con they were quite constant for several centuries before they started retreating in the 20th century. So clearly something has changed, uh, and it's, it's a widespread change. I think the glaciers are a very important uh, piece of uh, extra information to, to add to the thermometer record. Well, you often see graphs like this one. I'm now showing you once again the changes in temperature, globally average temperature. So the ups and downs from year to year are, uh, are, are, are quite clear there. And there's been recently, I think, a, a lot of misunderstanding with people doing things like picking out just the last uh, 10 years or so and saying, oh, gee, look, you know, if you look at that, uh, it doesn't look like warming is happening. But I think it's important to ask yourself if that seems fair to you. And one way to do that is to go back here, say, to that 10-year period when you also if you artfully pick your start point and your end point relative to the trend, you can make it look like that period is, is another one to help make your case. You can find another one like this. So, you know, you put all three of those together and say, well, look, the world's not warming. And that's obviously wrong because when you look at all the years put together, you clearly see that, that uh, warming has occurred. So are there ups and downs from year to year? Certainly there are. It's true. Is it relevant to understanding climate change? No because climate change is the long-term trend averaged across years and across the globe. And uh, if we, uh, uh, if we, oh, I forgot about the train. If we choose our, uh, our, uh, our years in a way to, uh, to, to be a little bit more fair, we can, uh, I think, look at the full record and see the, the clear evidence for global warming. Well, where do these thermometer records come from? I'm, I'm always inspired when I look at that. It's not really some mad scientist, you know, in a lab somewhere who's cooking up this data. It's people like this lady and uh, her husband who live in uh, a place in Alaska. They operate a seaplane, and uh, she's been an observer for 30 years, and Jim's been uh, observing with her for 25. It's people like this gentleman, uh, Mr. Burkholter, who has a family farm in uh, Ohio. And at this point, he's actually receiving an award from the National Weather Service for 100 years of, uh, of service because his, it was his great-grandfather who started taking weather records on that farm, and the family's been con continuing it ever since. This is actually what their record looks like from Philo, Ohio, and I'm going to talk more about uh, some of the uh, uh, other similar individual records at particular points. Again, you can now see even more variability than in the previous uh, slides that I've shown you, the global average, but you can also see uh, that the last uh, 40 years, at least, have, have been subject to warming. But of all the weather observers, I think this guy is my favorite because uh, he's, uh, he's someone who takes measurements at his home in Georgia. And uh, at, at some point, he uh, was awakened by a fire. And uh, after he got, I suppose, his cat and his family photos, what did he decide to save as he left his burning house but his weather data? So I, I think it's clear that there's a dedicated cadre of people that help us to understand what's going on with our global climate. Well, what about the weather locally? We always ask, how can our climate be changing when we see all these ups and downs, you know, from one winter to, to another in Chicago. If, if we, though, look a little bit more closely, I think it's, again, easy to understand the difference between weather and climate. When we have cold weather in the uh, American heartland, if you will, it's typically associated with a cold front coming out of Canada, as in, in this example. And so that makes this region get cold but it's just air trading places. It's no net loss of energy. So as it gets cold over, say, the Midwest, 
it's also getting warm over here in Oregon and Washington. And there's no net loss of energy. If we average across those, we'll find that the energy has been conserved. So averaging over space and time scales is absolutely critical to deducing meaningful climate changes. And we shouldn't be too confused by the fact that weather will give us local variability. Let's look at that a little bit more now. These are now the January monthly uh, temperature trends, so very similar to what I showed you before. And I should add, by the way, there are a few places in the world that are cooling, but they're very, very few. The, um, the American Southeast is an interesting example where the cooling trend seems to be due to land use, to the fact that we've cut down a lot of trees in that, in that region. Um, and they're growing back now, which is actually perhaps what's causing the cooling. Um, this may be very well due to an ocean temperature change, but the oceanic regions, we're seeing warming just about everywhere as well as on land, and I'm going to come back to that. But now I'd just like to show you a few more of those local records. There's what's happening at a grid point in Canada. Lots of ups and downs, but a clear trend. There's what's happening at a grid point in Australia. Again, plenty of ups and downs, but a very clear trend. And similar for a, a site not in Paris, to avoid the urban heat island, but, but near Paris, it's also warming. That's my home uh, near Denver, Colorado. It's uh, also warming. And uh, one of the things that's notable for Denver is that we're seeing a, uh, sorry, we're seeing fewer of the cold extremes happening. And I'm going to come back to that a little bit later, too. If we go ahead and average over the whole world, it's, it's now I think you get the sense of what climate change really is. It's not just the trends in the individual places. There's enough variability on those that if we had any one of them in isolation, we'd have a hard time talking about climate change. But when we have them all together, we can clearly see the, uh, that, that, they're all, that they're consistent and that the variability goes way down because now we've averaged across things like those weather fronts. So it's, uh, it's, it's really amazing what a, what a village, if you will, climate change actually is. Well, it's such a village that it's attracted the attention of many different governments. They have UN-style meetings where they get together and talk about what to do uh, and how to view the problem. And uh, occasionally, they have meetings that are not political and diplomatic, but that actually involve scientists where they're trying to reach a common understanding about what the science is. And as you know, um, I was the uh, chairman of the science panel that, uh, uh, together with my colleague, Professor Chin, uh, my co-chairman from China, we uh, led the process of communication of the science with the governments in 2007. And it was really quite an eye-opening and interesting experience. Governments all want good information about climate. They're all very interested. And they're, they're all wanting to understand the science better. It really is a, 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 an inspiring thing when you see how uh, interested they really are in knowing what the science can tell them and what it can't tell them. So one of the things that I think is important is to sit back and ask yourself how to communicate the fact that we have such uh, great data about not just the rising atmospheric temperatures from all those wonderful thermometers, um, but also sea level has been measured for more than a century, measured quite well. You can see that our seas on the average are rising. And the reason that's happening is, is, is mainly actually something pretty simple, which is that when you take water and you heat it up, it expands. If you've ever made a cup of tea, you know that that's true. So it's not too surprising that this is happening. Melting of ice on land, so the retreat of those glaciers will also contribute. But the main reason is just the thermal expansion of, uh, of, of the hot ocean, at least in the average over the last century. Um, if you have a look at the uh, northern hemisphere snow cover, less of the northern hemisphere is being covered by snow than used to be the case. So there's, these are just all three independent measurements that all tell you the world is warming. There's also glaciers retreating, as I mentioned. The oceans are warming worldwide. We have good measurements of that. Arctic sea ice extent is decreasing. Uh, we have satellite data since 1979, which take measurements worldwide, and it's, it's quite consistent, really, with what's happening here. Um, water vapor is also increasing, and that does confuse some people. Um, Water vapor is a greenhouse gas, but as you, again, might imagine if you've made a cup of tea, it's the fact that the water is getting hotter that causes the vapor above the water in your tea kettle to, uh, to increase. So 
Water is a, a, a factor in our atmosphere that responds to surface climate. It's a feedback, but it isn't something that will force surface climate to change. So the fact that water vapor is increasing certainly tells us that the planet must be warming because it's not independent of surface temperature. It's tied to surface temperature. So putting all those pieces of evidence together allows us to say that with so many different kinds of independent measurements, we can be quite confident that warming is happening. Warming really is unequivocal. Our planet is getting warmer than it used to be. So what could be causing this change? Um, is it something in our atmosphere holding more heat in? There's a great way to look at that. Uh, I've been to Antarctica. Um, five times, and uh, when I go down there, I get to say that I'm a member of uh, the ski club, and if you're a member of the South Pole Ski Club, you get to ski on three kilometers of base and three centimeters of powder, uh, because that's what the South Pole actually is. It's a great big block of ice that's more than a million years old, and it's built up and built up over the, over the ages. So it's great. You can dr drill a core uh, down into the ice and bring up the bubbles in, the, in that ice and uh, analyze the, the gas that's in the bubbles and take a look at what the composition of our atmosphere has been doing. And if we do that, we find out that we have a higher concentration of carbon dioxide today than we've had in more than half a million years. Carbon dioxide is a critical greenhouse gas, a very effective gas to absorb uh, energy that would otherwise escape to space. And if you have a look at this, 10,000 years ago, about the time that the mammoths were being hunted uh, and, and starting to, to die out from what we understand, the carbon dioxide was at this level. And a few thousand years later, when the Egyptians were building the pyramids, it was almost the same. And uh, when the Romans built the Colosseum, it was still almost the same. And then the Industrial Revolution came along. And that's really what we see here, that it's the... Uh, it's the Industrial Revolution that has caused this massive change. In the last century or so, carbon dioxide has increased by about a third compared to any level that we've seen in more than half a million years. And the main reason, of course, is the burning of fossil fuels to make energy. How much energy is uh, represented by the presence of all that extra carbon dioxide? I'd like to give a nice physical example. You may be familiar with the old uh, conventional Christmas tree lights. I'm not talking about the LED lights, which are low energy, but the old style lights um, actually give off about a watt uh, of energy. So the uh, warming, the extra energy supplied by that extra CO2 is equivalent to having about a Christmas tree light and a half over every square meter of the planet. So imagine that picture I showed you in the beginning of the lights of the planet, and now think about strings of Christmas tree lights every, on every um, square meter. There's some more people standing in the back. I just want to invite you to go around and come in because there's seats in the front. So please do have a seat if you'd like to. Okay, um, do greenhouse gases warm a planet, though? Let's really think about this. One of the things that I find really amazing about uh, the, the effect of greenhouse gases on a, on a planet is the fact that our sister planet, Venus, is actually hotter on average than Mercury, even though everyone knows Mercury is closer to the sun. So it's not the sun that's making Venus hotter. It's the fact that it has an atmosphere that has a lot of carbon dioxide. It actually also has sulfuric acid in the atmosphere, and both of those are strong greenhouse gases. So it has a very strong greenhouse gas, and that's what warms up Mer uh, Venus and makes it hotter than, even than Mercury. Our own Earth would be about 30 degrees colder than it actually is without our own atmosphere's background natural greenhouse effect. So we would be frozen. Life would have not evolved as it has. The greenhouse effect is clearly part of the chemistry and physics of any atmosphere. So if we increase carbon dioxide, it certainly implies a hotter Earth. But, but how much hotter? Well, let's talk a little bit about that now. Climate change has happened before, some people say to me. So why should we worry? It's another one of those very interesting uh, points that certainly is true, but is it relevant? I, I'm going to ask you to be the judge about this. And what I'm showing you here are, are temperatures over the last roughly half a million years. You all know it was colder, so there the temperatures are going down about uh, 20,000 years ago when we were in the last ice age. But you may not know that temperatures went up 100,000 years before that, 
There was another ice age, actually, about uh, 10,000 years before that. And indeed, there's been lots of ice ages and warm periods. The one we know about, the last one, 20,000 years ago, was not unique. They're very systematic, these ice ages. They happen roughly every 100,000 years. And that's because they're not mood swings. It's not that the planet decides, hey, I want to change my climate and be in a different state now. Um, these these uh, changes in temperature actually reflect changes in the Earth's orbital clock, which, are a rep which actually force the climate to change by changing the energy budget. And I'm gonna, I've already been talking about carbon dioxide as a change in the energy of our planet. It, I'm going to also talk about it as a forcing agent. It's something that's forcing the climate to change. In the same uh, sense, anything that changes the energy uh, on our planet is a forcing. So what causes these ice ages? Uh, several factors, but one of the simple ones to describe, and this is obviously a cartoon that greatly exaggerates the situation, is that on a very slow time scale, the difference, the, the, the distance between the sun and the earth actually changes. Also, the angle between the sun and, and the earth changes. Both of those things are changing on very, very slow time scales. That changes the energy that our planet receives from the sun, and that's the primary cause of past ice ages. Other factors contribute, but that's clearly the primary cause. So that's why it's so systematic because the orbit and that little wobble that happens in the orbit is actually related to the pull of gravity of the Sun and actually Jupiter. Those are the two objects that, that mainly are the ones that control that uh, orbital change. Well, we understand this orbital change very well. Another ice age is not going to happen for more than 10,000 years, so we don't need global warming to save us from the ice ages. What we actually should be thinking about, in my opinion, is the simple fact that if this kind of thing can change the energy budget and change our climate, if this forcing is so important as it seems to be, um, then that automatically tells us that anything that changes the energy budget will change our climate. And it turns out that the amount of energy represented by the carbon dioxide that we've added is, you know, of the same order as the kind of energy changes that we're talking about here. So it's, it's not a reason to say we shouldn't worry. It's actually a good reason to worry because it's, again, it's not the orbital change that's happening now, it's this extra change in the energy due to our own activities that are uh, responsible, as I'm going to show you in more detail in just a minute. The fact that it's happened in the past is all the more reason we should be concerned about it, because it's happening much faster now than any of those changes. Those changes happen on tens of thousands of years time scales. What I'm talking about is happening on time scales of a few decades. Very, very different. And I'll talk more about that in a minute, too. Okay, so here again are uh, the um, measurements of global temperature. And now I'm going to just show you what really tells us that uh, human activities are, are, are what's responsible for most of the warming. If we have a look at what would have happened if only natural factors had been at work, those natural factors include volcanoes, major volcanic eruptions that put particles in the stratosphere. So just like that haze that we put in the, in the, in the lower atmosphere that I was talking about when I showed you um, the behavior here, the fact that things didn't warm up so much in the, in the 50s and 60s as they did later because of man-made pollution, there's also natural sources of particles, which are these big volcanic eruptions, and they cause episodic cooling for a few years. And you can see that the uh, cooling effect has, has, has been observed. Also, there's a bunch of them in a row, so basically they've, they would have pulled the temperature down. The sun has not gotten hotter in this same 30-year period. We know that, so that's not the reason for the warming. Um, if we have a look at what would have happened when we include the natural and the human effects, the match is remarkably good. And again, you can see these, uh, these uh, volcanic events very clearly. So just like the ice ages, I, I really think the volcanoes are, are fascinating because they again tell us that if we change the energy budget of the planet, the climate will change. But what's the main factor driving um, what's happening in this long-term trend is the human accumulation of carbon dioxide, mainly. Well, what does this pattern look like in space? This is similar to what I showed you before. Um, just having a look now at the relative amount of warming as a function of position on the planet. So you can see that 
the regions that are warming up the most are on land, and that's what we expect because the ocean uh, is, is, uh, it has a higher heat capacity, so it's able to, to, to take up uh, heat differently than the land, and therefore the land warms up faster. Um, also, uh, the um, models are capable of reproducing just exactly that kind of fingerprint, and I think it's really quite remarkable what a good match in the pattern we actually get. So we have patterns in time, shown here. We have patterns in space, shown here. And it's actually the statistical matching of the, uh, the patterns that allows us to say that there's a 9 out of 10 chance, which we call very likely, that most of the warming, at least half of the warming, of the last 50 years is due to human increases in greenhouse gases. So that's where that statement comes from. Well, let's uh, actually zero in a little bit on North America and uh, ask ourselves again whether humans are responsible. Here's the observed distribution of warming on, uh, on our continent. And here's the uh, ups and downs from year to year and the overall trend. And there's the models. So those models that some people you know, like to make fun of, um, they're not perfect. But to me, I, I would say it's remarkably good. They give you too much warming over the Hudson Bay region and probably not quite enough over Alaska. But nevertheless, they do simulate uh, very well the much larger warming in high latitudes. The reason they're not doing so well over, say, Alaska is mainly because they don't give generally enough retreat of the Arctic sea ice. They, they have it retreating, but not as much as has been observed in that region. And uh, that's really interesting, too, because it's one of the interesting impacts of climate change that people like the Alaska native Inuit who live in some coastal villages right on the edge of the Alaskan coast there, um, they're having to leave those villages and relocate. And the reason is because as the sea ice has retreated, there's no longer that ice barrier between them and the incoming waves that are now crashing against the shore instead of crashing against the sea ice. And that's actually degrading the coastline of uh, northern Alaska and causing some of these people to lose their homes. Well, um, rainfall is another big issue, particularly where, where I live in the southwest. I don't want to spend too much time on this, but uh, I just want to say that the pattern of expected future rainfall change for uh, us in the southwest is, uh, is a matter of some, some interest, because what, what, we're, what we believe will probably happen is that the subtropical regions between about, say, uh, 10 degrees latitude and maybe 30 degrees latitude, or maybe even up to 40 in some places, are uh, going to get drier. So in the red regions, we're projecting that by the end of the century, those regions are likely to get 10 to 20 percent drier. That's a huge change because the Dust Bowl corresponded to about 5 to 15 percent uh, less rain. So it's a, it, 10 to 20 would be an enormous change in the rainfall in that region. Similarly, the Mediterranean is a region we expect to see dry, Western Australia. Um, it depends on the season, parts of South, South America as well. Um, and I, I want to emphasize that the colored regions here are places where at least two-thirds of the models agree. The stippled regions are places where 90% of the models agree. The places that are white are places where the models don't agree. So what that's telling you is that, indeed, there are quite a few regions where we don't know what's going to happen. A, lot, a significant part of the world here is white. We don't know what's going to happen in those regions. But in some regions, there's strong agreement among the models that uh, we're either going to see strong drying, as you see in those regions I identified, and actually also at high latitudes, we're pretty sure that things are going to get wetter. And that can be a problem, too, because, of course, if you are living in a wet location and you get even wetter, it's going to probably increase your chance of flooding. And again, these are big numbers. 10 to 20 percent more rainfall will change the water uh, characteristics of, say, uh, Europe, parts of Europe and parts of Canada and Alaska. Another thing that's really interesting is that what we find in many places is that when it does rain, it rains harder. And uh, these are just showing you the regions where that's true. And I think probably if I was from Chicago, it's the increased incidence of heavy rain that, that is probably going to be one of my biggest concerns. That's happening because when there's more, when the, when the planet gets hotter, by definition, there's more moisture in the atmosphere, as we've already said. There's more moisture. It's, it's going to rain. You're going to have harder rain when it does, when it does rain. 
Uh, and so the Midwest flooding in 2008 is probably uh, indicative of the kind of thing that we will see more often in the future. Um, I'm going to uh, actually skip this one in the interest of time. I thought about talking about fire, but just because I, I want to move along a little bit, I'm going to not do that. Um, I want to talk a little bit about a biological issue that's come up in, uh, where I live in the West. Um, these pictures that I'm showing you of these beautiful Western landscapes, that's not fall color that you're looking at. It's dead pine trees. The reason, tho the reason those trees are, are brown is because they're dead. They should be green year-round because they're pine trees. And the reason that it's happening is because we have had quite a lot of drought in the West, and so the trees get stressed, especially the lodgepole pine. The uh, other thing that's, that's clearly true is that our summer seasons are longer, and that's happening worldwide. It's well documented, and it's, uh, it's got a, a, a pretty strong link to global warming. So a few weeks more of summer season allows the beetles to, ble to breed twice in the season when normally they could perhaps only breed once, and so there's going to be more beetles. And uh, we also have fewer extreme cold snaps that kill these beetles. So it's these little pine beetles which get in the trees and, uh, and, and uh, destroy their, their internal system that's killing these trees, and there's more of them because of the changes in climate. So I'm really quite uh, intrigued by this. I think it just shows you how everything is going to be changing in a changing climate. It's, it's water, it's rainfall, it's uh, insects, it's birds, it's uh, you know, lizards, uh, it's all kinds of things are going to have to uh, be different. And I, find, I think that's going to be a fascinating thing to study from a scientific point of view. So if you're a scientist, you'll find it interesting. If you're a person asking yourself what, what impacts are facing you, it's, it depends very much on where you live. So it's a very much place-specific kind of issue. Okay, well, where is all that carbon dioxide coming from? I'm going to just move fairly quickly now because I've, I've, uh, I've quite a bit more I want to tell you. Um, which, which countries emit the most carbon dioxide per person? Well, the good news is that's a list of them, and we're not quite number one, but we're close. We emit something on the order of 20 tons per person per year. Actually, the, the new numbers are maybe closer to 25 tons per person per year. And that's about double what it is, say, in uh, countries in Europe or, or Japan. It's about uh, uh, 20 times more than a person in India. It's about four times more than the average person in China. I'm going to come back to what's happening in China for just a minute, but they have four times as many people as we do. So even though they emit about the same amount as we do, they emit four times less per person. And then there's all these countries down here that you don't hear much about. And I'm um, talking about places like Zambia, and Madagascar, and Ethiopia, Cambodia, Chad. I'm going to talk more about them in just a minute. Well, why do we do this? It's for more or less for th in, in thirds. Um, about a third of our uh, American carbon dioxide production has to do with energy. About a third has to do with transportation. And about a third is everything else, roughly. Um, and the other stuff is mainly industry and households and the servant service sector is the, that, that last third. So it's about a third, a third, a third. And uh, now I want to just focus in on those countries that don't emit very much, but I'm going to turn this issue on its head. I'm going to show you the ratio of U.S. per person emission to that of the country of interest. So if I turn it over and ask how many times uh, a person in Chad is the average American's emission, the answer is 1,000. So it would take 1,000 Chadians to emit as much carbon dioxide as the average one of us. It would take about 200 Ethiopians to emit as much carbon dioxide as the average one of us. It would take about 80 Kenyans. And when I do my round trip between Denver and Chicago, I will have emitted about as much carbon dioxide in that one trip as the average Kenyan does in a year. Um, about 20 times in Indian, as I said. Um, and uh, you can go on down the list. So it's really quite amazing, uh, the differences. But when you think about it, it's not too hard to understand that people who live like this are emitting a lot less carbon than people who live like this or people who live like that. On average, the 5.5 billion people who are currently in the developing world emit about five times less fossil carbon dioxide per person than the 1 billion that live in the developed world parts of our planet. 
So the question becomes, what about those people's future? What will happen as those five and a half billion people develop and uh, acquire the kinds of comforts that, that we have? Well, we've got a good example of that already going. Here's what's happened to our carbon emissions since 1990 in the U.S. They've gone up slightly, actually not because we've gotten less efficient, but mainly because our population has increased, so we've had more, we got a few more people. But that's what's happened in China. And uh, clearly, that big change in China is, uh, is a, a, a big driver of, of today's climate change. That's what's happened in Russia, India, Japan. And uh, certainly, what's happening in China is not that they're getting a lot more people. It's that the people that are already there are becoming much more wealthy. So they are acquiring all those things that involve carbon emissions. People sometimes talk about the climate problem as a population problem. I actually. I don't think that's quite the right way of looking at it. Even if all the people that are already here start emitting carbon as, as we do or as Europeans do, the planet is certainly going to get pretty hot. So it's not so much that there will be more people in the future. The people that are already here are changing their lifestyles and developing. Well, I want to spend a couple of minutes now talking about a concept that's actually tremendously important and which I think doesn't get talked about enough. And it is uh, the fact that uh, the carbon dioxide in our atmosphere is really kind of like the water in a bathtub. And uh, what that means is that what will happen if we reduce emissions or stop emissions is a little bit different than what you're used to thinking about for most pollution problems. So here's what carbon dioxide has done in the last thousand years, similar to what I showed you earlier, that big trend in the uh, 20th century. This isn't quite on the same time scale, and I apologize for that. But since 1750, this is what, how many million tons of CO2 has been emitted by fossil fuel burning. So if you wanted to take that carbon dioxide increase that's going on, and instead of having CO2 keep increasing, if you wanted to keep it constant, what would you have to do to the emissions? Well, most people, if you asked them that, would say, well, just do that. Keep the emissions constant and you know, the carbon dioxide will stabilize. And in fact, if that's what you were thinking, don't be embarrassed because uh, I think it's about 200 MIT graduate students were given a quiz on this, and that's what most of them said. So MIT graduate students think so. You, you, you're entitled to make that mistake yourself. But the right answer is not that, and here's the reason. Go to the bathtub over here and imagine a situation where twice as much water is coming in from the faucet as going out the drain. Well, if we keep the amount coming in from the faucet the same, the water in the bathtub will still increase. If we wanted to stabilize the water in that bathtub, what would we would have to do? We'd have to decrease the emissions by about 50%. And that's the situation that we're dealing with, except that the actual number is closer to about 80% in the long run. So if we wanted to keep our carbon dioxide from increasing, which would be the best bet for keeping our climate from from warming further, we would have to undergo a massive change in our energy supply, a reduction in CO2 emission by about 80%. Well, maybe we could think about geoengineering. We could cool the planet by doing artificial volcanoes. Um, you know, that's, that's perhaps possible. What about artificial trees? People talk about that, too. It's very hard to imagine that taking enough carbon out. All those things are subject of research, but I think all I'm going to say right now is it, it, we don't have a solution that's safely in hand. And we're facing something else that we've just talked about, which is the, that five-sixths of the planet's people who are currently emitting five times less carbon than the other one-sixth. And if they start emitting as we do, that's what's going to happen to the water coming in from the faucet. We're going to see a massive increase in CO2 emission and a massive increase in CO2 concentration in this century. That's why this issue is the fundamental environmental concern of this generation on our planet. Well, we have commitments to infrastructure, so it's pretty hard to think about changing this. You know, we have cars that we're going to keep for 10 years. We have power plants and homes that we're going to keep for 50 or 100 years. And, uh, you know, uh, it, all of those things are emitting carbon in a certain way to perform their very important functions. So I'll come back to that in just a second. Um, let me just talk about what would happen if we completely stopped emitting carbon tomorrow. Given all that infrastructure, I don't think that's going to happen. But if we were to stop emitting carbon uh, tomorrow, what would happen is that the temperatures 
would actually remain about the same for at least a thousand years. That's because some of the carbon would be lost rapidly, and I'm showing you that here. So here's the carbon ramping up, ramping up, ramping up. Then if we stop emitting, what we would see would be uh, uh, carbon dioxide would drop fairly rapidly for a while because it would be taken up by the surface ocean and by, by plants, things like trees. But those sinks are short-lived. You know, there's only so much space for trees to grow, for example. So that's not going to be a, a long-term solution for a lot of carbon. The only place for the carbon to really go in the long run is into the deep ocean, and it takes a long time for uh, water to get down to the deep ocean. That's just the turnover time of, uh, of, uh, of, of material in the ocean is quite slow. So that's why this uh, carbon sink slows down. And what, what actually ends up happening, and it's kind of scary actually, is that 20% of the carbon that we emit today will still be there a thousand years from now. So every choice that, you know, when I made the choice to get on the airplane, I was adding carbon to the atmosphere that I'm very aware will, some of it, a big chunk of it actually, will still be there a thousand years from now, and the planet will be as hot a thousand years from now as whatever the maximum is that we drive it up to before we, we make a change, if we were to choose to make a change. Why does that happen? Why does the planet stay so hot? Well, a lot of it, again, has to do with the ocean. And just in a simple way, you know, we have this beautiful blue planet with so much ocean, which has gotten hot because we've added energy to our planet. It's warmed up. And so uh, what, that's, uh, what that's doing is even if we were to stop emitting carbon tomorrow and the carbon dioxide would, stop, would start to drop, the heat would come out of the ocean back to the atmosphere, if you want to think of it that way. So we, we, we're going to have a big time lag in cooling off because so much energy is in the ocean. And you might want to just think about that. You know, it's kind of like when you, when you go to you know, one of those greasy buffet type things in the cafeteria. Oh, no, the food I'm sure is much better than when I was a student. But, but you probably still have these heat lamps, you know, stuff like that. So you know, the heat lamps make the food hot. And if you were to turn off the, the heat lamp, the the air above the food would cool off a lot faster than the food itself. In the same way, uh, that big ocean is going to stay hot a lot longer than the air above the ocean. So what's coming and, and how fast? We learn in driver ed that when, when we drive around, we need to really always be looking in the rearview mirror and uh, knowing whether what's behind us looks like this or whether maybe it looks like that or whether maybe it looks like that. And uh, when I think about this issue, I think about four primary things. The bathtub problem, as I've already been discussing. The fact that carbon emissions are so much bigger today than the natural removals. The international issues are incredibly challenging. Developed nations versus developing nations. The past and the future contributions. The infrastructure, we've all got all that stuff. We want to keep it for a long time, and it's emitting a lot of carbon. And uh, can we fix it later? Well, we don't think so, because the climate change we're producing due to carbon dioxide increases is going to last more than 1,000 years, and the warming will as well. So a decision to just kind of wait and see has consequences. Well, I don't want to be depressing. I want to spend a couple of more minutes of your time just uh, trying to kind of put this in a little bit different context and then talk about, um, about why I am optimistic for just a couple minutes. Um, as you uh, may know, I was also very involved in the ozone depletion issue, which is, a, a, to first order at least, a very different, completely separate scientific issue. Some people think that ozone depletion and climate change are the same thing. That's, that's not true. Um, ozone depletion is a completely separate issue. We're concerned about ozone because it protects our planet from ultraviolet light, uh, and uh, it was getting depleted due to uh, chlorofluorocarbon emissions, and the nations of the world got together and decided that instead of continuing to emit, as they had been doing, that they would basically ramp down emissions. And nowadays, the chlorofluorocarbons are decaying. Like the CO2, they don't decay quickly. Their uh, lifetimes are, are shorter than CO2, to be sure. It's only about 50 to 100 years. Uh, but even with zero emission, we still have quite a bit of, carb of uh, chlorofluorocarbon in the atmosphere. It's what's causing that uh, remarkable Antarctic ozone hole that took me to Antarctica. And we know that from these wonderful measurements of ozone made by the British Antarctic Survey beginning in the uh, 1950s. And you can clearly see the ozone staying about the same and then kind of taking a nosedive in the 80s. And it's going to take many years for it to recover. 
Okay, well now we're going to try to uh, have a little quiz. We're going to have a little audience participation. Um, and the question that I'm asking you to think about is what you think the answers are to the uh, identities of the three different countries that are involved here. So this is a, a, these are quotations, direct quotations from a book about the ozone protocol negotiations, which took place in 1987 mainly. Um, and there was a country, we're going to call them X, who were skeptical about the theory. They said, oh, you know, the effects won't be that harmful, even if it happens. Uh, and that was, uh, that was government X. Government Y was pretty similar. Um, they, this person who was involved in the negotiations thought that they were basing their position on the tactics of the big companies, the chemical companies at that time. Okay, it was government Z and its allies that introduced a resolution and said, you know, we should have a protocol, we should phase these things out. Um, we, we, we have to have a protocol with, with targets and timetables. So which government was X, the most skeptical, and which was Z, who led the others to a global agreement? If you're over 30, please don't vote because you probably should know the answer. You were, um, you know, alive back then, you might remember. But please, somebody under 30, tell me who you think X was, the most skeptical government. The United States, okay? Uh, who do you think was government Z? The people who said, let's get together, let's solve this thing, let's care about the planet, that kind of stuff. Who do you think would, might have been Z? Sweden. Sweden. There's the right answers. The most skeptical government was the UK. They were closely followed, actually, by the European Commission, led by France and Germany at that time. And it was the United States government and its allies, which included Sweden and Norway and Canada, who uh, introduced the resolution to uh, have a legally binding control protocol. Well, why did this happen? Many different reasons. It really took a village. And uh, I'm going to take just a minute to walk you through this slide. Um, so what this is showing you are the emissions of the things that were causing the problem. At, as a function of time, emissions from the United States, emissions from the rest of the world, and the total. And you see something interesting happened. In the U.S., the emissions started dropping in the early 70s. Well, the Montreal Protocol, the international negotiations, actually happened to, uh, to occur quite a bit later in 1987. And the ozone hole wasn't actually discovered until 1985. In about 1974, it was theorized that these chlorofluorocarbons might be dangerous, that if we kept using them, that uh, we might someday deplete the ozone layer. It turned out that we depleted the ozone layer a lot more than we were afraid of. It was even worse than we feared at that time. Um, and it happened a lot sooner. No one thought there would be an ozone hole, but boom, suddenly there was one. But just the theory was enough to cause a change in the United States. And the reason there was a change is that U.S. consumers stopped using spray cans. At that time, most of the uh, uh, chlorofluorocarbon that was used in the United States was for what was called personal care products, so basically hairspray and underarm deodorant in medicine cabinets all around the United States. And I can remember deciding that, you know, hey, that seemed pretty simple. Instead of using... Um, that kind of deodorant, well, maybe I'd use this kind, the roll-on kind, and then there's no spray to get into the atmosphere. I want to hasten to say sprays are perfectly fine now. They no longer contain chlorofluorocarbons, so don't go home and throw away all your spray cans. You don't need to do that. They don't have the bad stuff in them anymore. But giving up spray cans at that time was not too difficult for many people, and it did something very important. It made what had been good business, growing at 10% you know, per year clip, and since we've been through this uh, terrible recession, we all know that you know, growth is, is great for business. Uh, not growing, even not growing a little bit, is really bad for business and painful for everyone. So it turned the chlorofluorocarbon production uh, uh, business into bad business, basically, that people in the US made that choice. It was an easy choice. We're facing very different, much more difficult choices uh, here, you know, you, you don't think about throwing away your car the same way you would think about maybe not, maybe throwing away your spray deodorant or even slightly not, you know, only slightly less, less useful, deciding that the next time you buy deodorant it won't be a spray, it's going to be a roll-on. So 
the people made that choice. It was an easy choice, but important, and they made it, and it changed the business into, into uh, what, what I think it's fair to say is bad business. Well, that's me going to Antarctica to investigate the ozone hole. It was minus 40 degrees when I arrived. Um, you don't have to do any conversion to Celsius, because that's actually the same in Celsius. It's the one temperature where that happens. Uh, and it was an incredible experience, a wonderful thing to be part of. So, you know, when I think back on it, I'm, I'm actually still optimistic because the question sometimes asked, is it already too late on climate? There was a very wonderful paper that came out in Science just a few weeks ago that talked about how much past and future emissions we're going to have uh, from stuff that we already have. So the future emission, if all we did was emit the from the cars and the power plants that we already have would look something like this. It's really the future infrastructure yet to be built that will uh, account for most of the emission. It's not the past. That's significant, but it's mostly the future that's going to, uh, to, to control the climate in the 21st century if we keep doing business as we are, as we have been doing, I should say. And that would lead to something like 3 to 7 degrees warming by 2100. So our joint choices on what stuff we want to have matter a great deal. It's, it, it is not the case that we're already locked into you know, some, some terrible climate. Um, the future of production is going to be really important for all those things that I've talked about already. So we're really making choices now whether we want to have what you might call the Blade Runner future in which you know, everybody was sweating all the time and it was raining all the time. And, uh, or the Star Trek future. Um, and I'm not saying that I know that antimatter is going to be the fuel of choice. Um, I don't know what's going to be the fuel of choice. It might be solar, it might be wind, it might be ocean, uh, it might be geothermal, it might be nuclear. I'm not trying to, 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 uh, to say anything about that. But I think that there's some wonderful things going on now where the planet is thinking about their choices of what kind of uh, energy system to have. And I'm thinking about it too. People sometimes ask me, okay, um, you know, if I were to be concerned about this, what should I do? I am not going to tell you what to do. That's a decision only you can make. But what I do want to tell you is that, you know, what I think is mainly may, perhaps a, a useful, prudent thing to think about is what is your carbon footprint? And it will make you think about that thousand years when all that carbon that you're emitting is going to be in the atmosphere and it'll make you probably choose to get one of these instead of using, um, say, the, the plastic bottles, which is something that I always do now, because I feel really bad. I feel really guilty. This is my carbon. I emit about 140 tons in a year because I fly a lot. It's a lot of trips to places like Chicago, giving talks and going to places to be at scientific meetings, and all of that emits carbon. Um, so my carbon footprint is, you know, uh, it's not coming from my vehicle, which is one of these, and uh, I, I love it. It's like driving a video game. Um, but it is coming from, from that, and it gives me a carbon footprint kind of like Godzilla. Um, so, you know, you, everyone has to think about how they're going to deal with this. What I do is actually, and I'm not telling you to do it, but I do do it myself. I go on the web and I offset my carbon with uh, some, some choices about, uh, uh, about uh, ways to recover um, particularly to recover land that's been forested in the past and let the forest grow back. That's so engagement to me is all the reasons why I'm optimistic. You see people everywhere thinking about this issue. We don't all agree. There's a lot of, uh, of conflict and discussion going on, but I think all of that discussion is the beginning of, uh, of a very healthy process that will lead us to our own societal joint choice. And thank you very much for your attention. I'd be happy to answer questions.